Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. Today we'll get the most realistic of all our models for gases. It's the last topic we're covering in this course, so it makes sense to end the course with the most realistic problems so far. We'll be using more and more realistic examples all throughout the General Chemistry 2 course, so this is our first step in that direction. In the last video, we talked about the ideal gas law, which tells us how the pressure, volume, temperature, and amount of a gas are all related to each other. This is a really useful equation, and it gets applied in all kinds of chemical research. As we saw last time, we can even use it to identify unknown gases when we have a gas sample we're not sure about. But notice the name of the equation is the ideal gas law. Calling it ideal tells us that the equation isn't 100% realistic. To understand why not, we need to remember something that we talked about back in video 35. In that video, we talked about the kinetic theory of gases. All the gas laws we've studied so far, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, and the ideal gas law, are all based on the kinetic theory of gases. But unfortunately, the kinetic theory makes a couple of assumptions that aren't very realistic. We mentioned them back in video 35, but let's talk about them again. First, because the molecules in a gas are so far apart, the kinetic theory makes the approximation that the molecules themselves don't actually take up any space at all in the gas. Of course, that's not really true. The molecules really do take up some space in the container, even though it's not very much. So as a result, the volume that's available for the molecules to move around in is a little less than V, which is the total volume of the gas. So to make the ideal gas law a little more accurate, we shouldn't use V. Instead, we should subtract the tiny volume that's actually taken up by the molecules themselves. That will be equal to N times B. N is the number of moles of gas, and B is the volume that a mole of actual molecules take up. So that takes care of one of the incorrect assumptions that the kinetic theory of gases makes. The other assumption the kinetic theory makes is that the molecules don't attract or repel each other. This also isn't true. We know that all molecules contain protons and electrons. So the electrons in one molecule will repel the electrons in the other molecules and will attract protons in the other molecules. Because the molecules stick to each other when they're attracted, they collide with the walls of the container with more force. That means the pressure will be higher than expected. So to make the ideal gas law more accurate, we shouldn't just use P. Instead, we make a correction to the pressure, which is N squared times A over V squared. There's a bit of physics involved in coming up with that correction, and we won't be going into that math. The important thing to know for now is that a is a number that tells us how much the molecules in a gas are attracted to each other. So there were two assumptions in the kinetic theory, and as a result, we had to make two corrections to the ideal gas law. If we put them both together, we get this equation. It's more complicated than the ideal gas law, but it's also a lot more accurate. This equation was first determined in 1873 by the Dutch physicist Johannes van der Waals, and it's one of the achievements that won him the Nobel Prize in physics in 1910. Van der Waals was especially interested in the forces that make molecules attract each other, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about them at the beginning of the General Chemistry 2 course. I hope you'll come back and join me for those videos soon. Notice that each of the two corrections in this equation contains a constant. A or B. A and B are different for every compound, so we need to look them up in a book or a table in order to use them in the equation. Here's a table that lists several values of A and B for different gases. Notice that the values kind of make sense. For example, look at the values for the first five gases. These are the first five gases in the last column of the periodic table. As you can see, for the most part, the value of B gets higher as we go down the periodic table. That makes sense, because B tells us the volume that the atoms take up, and we expect them to be bigger as we go down the periodic table. Notice that the value of A also gets bigger as we go down. That makes sense too, 
because the number of electrons and protons in the atoms gets higher as we go down the periodic table. And the constant A tells us how strong the attractions are between the atoms in these gases. So the van der Waals equation gives us a more accurate picture of a gas than the ideal gas law does. How much better is it? Let's try an example and find out. Suppose we have 0.400 moles of chlorine gas at a pressure of 1,000 millimeters of mercury in a 5 liter container. We want to know its temperature. Let's calculate it two different ways. First, we'll use the ideal gas law. We want to solve for T, and we have all the information we need. The pressure is 1,000 millimeters of mercury. Remember, we need to make sure we use the correct unit, which is atmospheres for pressure. If you don't remember how to convert millimeters of mercury to atmospheres, you'll want to check video 35, where we talked a lot more about the pressure. In that video, we saw that there are 760 millimeters of mercury in an atmosphere. So our pressure here is 1.32 atmospheres. The volume is 5.00 liters, and N is 0 0.400 moles. You might recall from the last video that R is a constant, 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. Solving for the temperature gives us an answer of 200 kelvin. Now let's do this again, but this time using the van der Waals equation. That equation is more realistic, so that should give us a more accurate result when we calculate the temperature. We'll just plug in the same data that we had when we used the ideal gas law. 1.32 atmospheres for the pressure, 5.00 liters for the volume, 0 0.400 moles for N, and 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over Kelvin's moles for R. In order to solve the equation, we need to know A and B, and we get those from the table that we saw before. A is 6.49 liters squared times atmospheres over moles squared, and B is 0 0.0562 liters over moles. This is a more complicated equation than any other equation that we've solved in this course, so you'll want to take it slow when we start solving it. First, let's solve the fraction in the first set of parentheses. That gives us 0 0.0415 atmospheres. Notice that the liters and moles in that fraction all canceled out. Next, let's solve this part. That gives us 0.0225 liters. So the first parentheses gives us 1.36 atmospheres, and the second set of parentheses gives us 4.78 liters. Now that we've simplified the equation a bit, we can solve easily for T. When we do, we get 206 Kelvin. Remember, we got 200 Kelvin when we calculated this using the ideal gas law, so we got an answer that was about 3% different when we used the more accurate van der Waals equation. That's a significant difference, so the van der Waals equation definitely gave us a noticeably better result. Well, that's all for today, and that's the end of our General Chemistry 1 course. I hope you've learned lots and enjoyed watching these videos. If you want to learn more, you can continue on and join me for the series of videos for General Chemistry 2. I hope you will. In the meantime, good luck on your final exams. Have a good week, good luck again on your exams, and have a great winter vacation.